Four students leaving a party, a dark street, a short walk back to campus. But for one college freshman, the person trusted to walk her home seemed to be the reason she was never seen again. For decades, the case lingered, the investigation changed hands, and it wasn't until a renewed media scrutiny that arrests were made. Did the authorities have their suspect from day one? This week's episode is The Disappearance of Kristen Smart, Part 1. In the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Well, this is one that uh, we've gotten repeated requests for and now obviously with the breaks in the case seems like a good time to talk about it for sure i um i would always get uh whenever i think of kristen smart i think of elizabeth smart too yep and um i had never really read a ton about kristen's case but we repeatedly get requests for it all the time and chris lambert recently came out with your Own Backyard, which is a fantastic podcast that goes into a ton of detail. It's eight episodes, if you guys haven't listened. I know a lot of people have because they always recommend it when they recommend this case. But why did we get into this, Heather? Why did we get well, into podcasting? I found the treasure trove mm-hmm. of Sinisterhood text initially when Christy and I were just co-performers at DCH. Rest in peace. Pour one out. <laughs> <laughs> when you messaged me and asked me to to sub in for one of your troops, and I said, yes, I would love to. And then you had posted previously about wanting to solve a cold case. And we're like, I'm like, hey, we have a conference room at my co-working space. Like, let's do this. Christy's goal was to start a, you said something like a book club, but instead of a book club, we solve crimes. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, uh, he did it alone. I'm, well, not totally alone. I'm sure he had like, you know, help and stuff, but- Chris Lambert mm-hmm. is living the dream. He is living our he <laughs> initial is. dream of what we set out to do was to d- deep dive into a case. And exactly what you said today, we were talking about um, how excellent his show is. And you said, I would love to be able to give the gift that he's given to the Smart family, give that gift to a family. Yes. Yeah. Kudos to him for he grew up in the area. He was, I think he said, eight years old when mm-hmm. she was killed and and he always saw the billboard and then as an adult he was like why is this still not solved and then when you you start digging into it oh yeah why wasn't this solved because everything points to who has now been arrested and charged with her murder paul flores but from the from the jump i mean you could have asked anybody that had just read a few articles and they'd said, oh, yeah, I'm sure it's him, right? And then you're like... You could have asked anyone that met him for three seconds, (laughs) Yeah, he's a huge creep sex predator. I mean, with a long history of it. And it's uh, it's egregious that um, the the botched investigation from several police departments. So, you know, it's such a weird thing, but such an awesome thing that we now live in a world where podcasts help solve crimes. Just yeah. armchair sleuths help solve crimes. Michelle McNamara. That's what oh, I was yeah. just about to say. I mean... And Paul Holes and yes, Billy Jensen yes. are doing great stuff on Murder Squad. And they, you know, I think they've had three now um, where people who listen to the show uploaded their DNA into like Jed Match and things like that. And that have led to arrests and cases. Amazing. So, it really does, and that's not an exaggeration, us saying that the podcast helped the case. The actual sheriff said that. He's oh, yes. repeatedly said that. And the family, too. I mean, the Smart mm-hmm. family has said he, Chris Lambert, has been a blessing to our family. He got this case back out in the spotlight again. He got new eyes and ears on it and people interested mm-hmm. in it that it had just been dormant for so long. And we were going to do it, Heather. We're gonna, we're do, gonna it. do it. We, we we'll have a we gotta have a sinisterhood side side hustle where we we'll keep doing the show for you guys. 
But we're going to solve a crime. But we're also going to, yeah, solve a crime and then turn that into something as well. Put it, yes, we'll put it in the universe. We'll bring awareness mm-hmm. to an unsolved crime, and hopefully, somebody who knows something will come forward. That's we'll manifest it and then help a family that that needs help. I would love that. Yes, that's what we shall do. But he's very inspirational because he would just go. I just sent him an email to see if they'd respond, mm-hmm. and then people responded. And especially after the first three or four episodes, I think. You get an email that says, hey, I'm doing a podcast, and you go back and listen, and you go, oh, this is respectfully done mm-hmm. and well-researched and thoughtful and not biased and not and isn't uh, conjecture. I mean, everything he has is backed up by he either asks in a question form, which is great. I was scrutinizing it the whole time, not you know, not to criticize him, but I thought, man, this is really bold and brave to say this person is the, the suspect. And, you know, for fear of defamation mm-hmm. or something like that, the Flores family has sued the Smart family, so they're not afraid of lawsuits. And the way it's presented, it's so well done for a person who calls himself, you know, he said, I'm kind of an amateur journalist. Mm-hmm. You know, he was an audio engineer. It's so excellently done that he isn't going, well, we all know it's obviously Paul Flores. He's like, here's 53 facts. Yeah. You you put them together. Yeah. He's like, well, he goes, maybe Paul Flores is just really unlucky. I don't know. You tell me. And it's like, he's clearly not. No. I mean, I so mean, but I was very impressed. But yes. He, but that's, that's, you got to do that, you know? Yes. Yeah. To, to CYA. But now he's been arrested. So yeah, there's not, we're not defaming we anybody. Can, we can say whatever we want about him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to probably do a three parter on this. TBD, we, uh, but yeah, I yeah think TBD, so. but, um, this first episode, we're going to cover Kristen's early life, going to college, and uh, the disappearance, and a few things after that as well. And um, it's a doozy. Yeah, there's. I've been nonstop reading. I mean, we both have, so it, it really gets into your brain, dude. The amount of articles out there on this are. I mean, mm-hmm. it spans twenty five years. So yeah, and especially any time when a case these can. Cases like this can be challenging on our end for research because whenever there has been something super recent break in the case, that's all you find. Yeah. So it's I have to go to yes. Google tool search tools anything before twenty twenty. Yes, you <laughs> got like to do a lot of filters and a lot of digging to get back to the stuff before all the arrests. But it's a good problem to have because this motherfucker and uh, I will repeatedly call him that throughout this episode. Uh, he's not. He's should he's have been dope. arrested uh, years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably May 27th or mm-hmm. 28th of 1996. 1996 yeah. So we're a little behind. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Kristen Denise Smart was born February 20th, 1977 to Stan and Denise Smart in Augsburg, Bavaria, West Germany where Kristen's parents were teaching the children of military personnel. According to the Kristen Smart Scholarship site, Kristen came into this world with an adventurous spirit that never left her. The family goes on to say that Kristen's passion for adventure, music, and the ocean left an indelible mark on everyone in our family. As a young child, Kristen moved with her parents and brother and sister to Stockton, California, where she spent her teenage years, eventually attending Lincoln High High School, where she graduated in 1995. Her first college choice was a university located on the beautiful Virgin Islands, but Kristen's parents were concerned about her being that far away from home. Instead, Kristen decided to attend California Polytechnic State University, or Cal Poly, roughly a four-hour drive from her parents' home in Stockton. Later, Stan Smart told the LA Times, We thought it would be a good place for her. We thought it was a safe community, you know, and it is. It just didn't work out that way for our family. Yeah, she was a. She did a, a study abroad in Venezuela, and she spent the summers in Hawaii doing summer camp, As a camp counseling. Counselor, what a job, by the way. Dude, God. It was awesome. Yeah, and planned to go back. So that's sad yeah. that she didn't. You know, but she looked at other colleges, and then you know decided to to go to this one, which is you think as a parent, oh, okay, well, if anything happens, I can just run up and mm-hmm. get her. And that's you know heartbreaking that that's not the case. They're far enough away to where you still can. Do your own thing. You don't feel like you're under the thumb of your parents, but it's close enough that you can go home on the weekends if you want to. Still be a little independent, but not too far from Mm -hmm. home. Recently, Kristen had been struggling in some of her classes and had made a comment to a friend that it felt like school would never end. She had adopted several nicknames for herself at school. Roxy, 
Marisol, and Kiana, according to the LA Times. In the weeks before her disappearance, she dyed her hair dark brown, according to an interview with her mom on the podcast Your Own Backyard. By all accounts, it appeared as if Kristen was having a normal college freshman experience, being stressed out about grades and trying to discover her true identity. Yeah, her mom said the last letter she wrote her was like, you got to grow up, you know, yeah. it's not everything's easy. And, you know, it's like a tough love kind of a thing from a parent. But then your heart breaks later when you think, oh, my God, and it's not the last thing she ever said to her. But it's still you think, oh, that's the last letter I wrote her like, ugh. but you're being a good parent. You know, you can't beat yourself up. I think you analyze a lot of things you said and did over many, many years when something tragic like this happens. Mm-hmm. It's a dangerous place to live. Let your brain go there for a minute, you know, work things out. But you got to get out of there. She also was having some problems in a biology class. Her professor had lost a test she had taken and Mm -hmm. wasn't sure if she's going to be able to retake it. And it was really stressing her out. But then he said, you can retake it. And she called her parents every Sunday. And she had called on this on the day she goes missing earlier in the day and left him a message and said, I've got good news. And later they found out that it was, he was going to let her retake it. But that's also the last voicemail they have from her, something that she's excited to share with them. And things were kind of looking up. Yeah. And that's what her dad's like, Oh man, you just, you wish you would have answered the phone. Yeah. I said that too, when I lost my dad, but then all the missed calls are voicemails. Then you have a recording of their voice that you didn't think you'd have. I said that when I missed, when I lost my dad too. I had mm-hmm. been planning on calling him, I think, two days before, mm-hmm. and I didn't. And that was one of the first things that I said was, why didn't I call him when I said I was going to? And so now I have a ton of anxiety <laughs> when it comes <laughs> to uh, the last thing I say to people or not calling. Like, if I think about somebody and what if somebody I haven't thought about in a long time, like pops in my brain, I'll think. There's a reason this has happened. I've got to reach out to them and call. I got a lot of issues. I got a lot no, of, but it's a lot of anxiety and stuff. But yeah, I mean, you never, like we said with um, William and Harry with Princess Di, they didn't know that was going to be the last conversation mm-hmm. with your mom, you know. And you can't live your life like that, thinking, I've got to get everything out there in this conversation because mm-hmm. this might be the last time I see him. But also, what does John Mayer say? Who? Say what you need to say. That's right. You know? I was going to say your body is a wonderland, but that's more appropriate yeah. for what. I know it's true, though. Yeah, I think that song always gets me because I've never looked at the what that song's about. You probably know. But to me, it's about saying goodbye to someone at the yeah, end of their life. Yeah. Being uh, happy with the last conversation you've had. Mm-hmm. You don't know what that song's about? I would I would have thought you knew all the John Mayer. Dig into the dirt. Yeah. Of John Mayer. Everyone's always like, that song's about Katy Perry. They think every John Mayer song's about Katy Perry. Is Wonderland about Katy Perry? No, people think that one's about Jennifer Love Hewitt. Oh, he's got a type. Petite, <laughs> petite brunettes. Yeah. Well, sorry. Not, not in his wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> On the evening of May 24th, 1996... Kristen and a few friends from her dorm headed out for the evening, a welcome break from the recent stress of finals. After driving around for a couple of hours, Kristen suggested they head off campus to Fraternity Row, where a friend of hers was celebrating his birthday. Not wanting to go to the party, Kristen's friends instead dropped her off. Margarita Campos, one of the friends with her that evening, told the San Luis Obispo Telegram Tribune, When we dropped her off, she seemed a little mad that we wouldn't go with her. She kept saying, you go with me, but I didn't want to go. I told her, you better be careful. She said she would be fine. Then she said bye. Apparently, this fraternity, as so many do, had a bit of a reputation for having rowdy parties and being very testosterone-filled. So I can understand why these girls didn't want to go go to that, but they, Margarita said she was super independent and... You know, a lot of our friends wouldn't have gone to that party by themselves, but that was kind of Kristen. She was independent, and if she wanted to to go, she was going to go. It sounded like quite a party, and it wasn't huge. I mean, it wasn't like hundreds of people. No, I think, I think they was, said around 60. Yeah, around 60 yeah. people. So, But still, it's, it's all crammed in a house. I don't know. <laughs> it's not my days of My days of parties Did you like go to frat parties in college? 
Uh, not in Chicago, but when I lived in New Orleans, I did. I yeah. did. I drank a shot from a nice luge. Nice. My first yes. and only time. I, I felt very proud of myself. I think I d- did that at a frat party, too. A Halloween frat party at Tech. But you do kind of think, okay, well, you know, everybody's here from campus. It's It almost is like a false sense of security. Mm-hmm. Around 2 a.m. on May 25th, the party at the Kappa Chi house began to break up. Fellow students and partygoers Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis began walking back to their dorms when they spotted Kristen passed out in the yard next door to the unofficial frat house at 137 Crandall Way. According to the L.A. Times, Cheryl and Kristen were not friends. They just both attended Cal Poly. Tim was also not friends with her, just a good Samaritan senior. Cheryl and Tim helped her up, later telling investigators that Kristen needed support to be able to walk, according to the New York Times. Yeah, it was kind of, you, they were, okay, well, I'll go walk with you, and I'll walk with you. Oh, that girl, she needs help. Let's take her with us. And good for so, them for doing that. Yeah, that's yeah. really nice. Yeah, Cheryl was, another person was supposed to walk her back, and he had left the party, and so Tim said, I'm going that way. He had parked off campus, but Cheryl was going back to her dorm, and luckily someone someone stopped and, and helped her up. A private investigator later questioned some of the students who had been at the party. They described Kristen's behavior as weird, as if she was on something. Some students reported seeing her taking shots of tequila and chugging glasses of vodka. Others said they never saw her with a drink, leading her parents to question if she had possibly been drugged. Yeah, on the podcast, he interviews a guy that was at the party and said she grabbed him and pulled him into the bathroom Mm -hmm. and started going, am I pretty? Do I look pretty? And he said, I don't what? Yeah, you're fine. I don't know. And then left the bathroom, and he was confronted outside the bathroom by a guy who said, "What'd you do with her in there?" And he said, "I don't, I don't know what you're talking about." I don't know. And he said, "Oh," and he said, "Nothing happened." And the guy said, "Oh, okay, good." Ha. <laughs> and was we'll it Paul Flores? It was indeed. And another person said they saw Flores. They heard a sound. A they thump. looked in the, a thump. They looked in the hallway, and Kristen was on the ground, and Paul was on top of her, yes. and. The guy that saw this didn't know if it was intentional or if they had bumped into each other. He said they kind of laughed it off and and both got up and went their own way. But by all accounts, and in my opinion, it seemed like he was stalking her at that party. And we will see he is a stalker. He has a history with multiple women that he worked with, uh, following him around, keeping an eye on him. So... Because there has never been a body, they haven't been able to do, they were never able to do a toxicology test on it. It would not surprise me if he had slipped her something and then watched the, watched it unfold and we'll see that he jumps. It's the opportunity to walk her back to her dorm. Yeah, it's a, it, it would have to just be conjecture, but maybe is that a reason why to hide a body? I don't know. So that it can't be tested. As Tim, Cheryl, and Kristen began to walk back to their dorms, 19-year-old Cal Poly freshman Paul Flores, who had also been at the party, approached the group. Out of nowhere, according to Tim, and began walking with them. Paul said his dorm was next door to Kristen's so he could help her get home. The foursome carried on, with Tim shortly breaking off to head to his car. Yeah, they said um, he just kind of showed up. He's like a sidler. Yeah. He sidled up on yeah, him. They're just, like, Ugh. Yeah. Which, again, that is his personality. Is a lurker, watcher, lurker, creeper. In a later deposition, Cheryl said that as the three continued their slow walk to the dorms, Kristen and Paul would occasionally stop. As Paul held Kristen upright, he would tell Cheryl, Go ahead if you want. Which Cheryl said she thought was, A little strange. According to the LA Times. Near the intersection of Perimeter and Grand Avenue, at approximately 2.30 a.m., Cheryl also parted ways, heading back to her dorm. Yeah, Kristen had on a crop top and running shorts, Mm -hmm. and Cheryl said his arm was around her bare stomach, and he was kind of walking behind her and had his, because she's 6'1", he's Mm 5'10", and so he's got his arm around her stomach, and that, yeah, he kept saying, you can go ahead. Weird to me. You you tell me. Weird. I find... Um, And then when Cheryl said, okay, my dorm's this way, Paul said, okay, give me a kiss goodnight, and Mm -hmm. she said, I will not do that, and he's like, well, just one on the cheek, and she said, I will not do that, and he said, well, what about a hug? No, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, he um she said that several times he she got the impression that he was trying to get rid of her. That yes. telling her to go ahead and that he wanted to be alone with Kristen. 
He had also, I guess, kissed her roommate or tried to forcibly kiss her roommate a few months earlier. So again, and we go through his history, not only asking, forcing himself on women and then, or asking for inappropriate affection that seems it's aberrant it's bizarre he also at the party that they were at got into it with somebody because he was hitting on their girlfriend right in front of him which is another thing he did all the time so yeah. it was inappropriate a, yeah who knows if it was just super ballsy or complete lack of social awareness and social skills second one yeah during cheryl's deposition which denise and stan smart attended she attempted to explain why she left their daughter with Paul. I said, will you walk her to her room? You know, will you take her back to her room? And he said, yes. And I said something about yes. And he said, you know, and I said, if, if you won't, I will. I'll walk her to her room. You know, I, I didn't want to have to do it. But, you know, if, if he didn't want to do it, you know, I, I was going to do it. Flores had assured Cheryl he would make sure Kristen got back to her dorm room safely. He then, according to Cheryl, asked her for a hug and a kiss before heading on his way. Unnerved and disgusted, Cheryl declined. She then watched them walk away, Flores with his arm around Kristen's waist. You got to know if you're, her parents are sitting there and you are just it, trying to justify why. And you know, I mean, she, Cheryl did nothing wrong. She couldn't have uh -uh. predicted what was going to happen was going to happen. Maybe we can all learn something from that. You know, don't we, women have to look out for women. If you yeah. if you feel like something's wrong and that guy's a creep, stay with them. Don't don't let them yeah. go. But, you know, I mean, she can't be blamed for for what happened. I imagine every day she uh, thinks about, man, what if I just hadn't let her let her go off? And for a while, she was even very shortly considered maybe a suspect, which got shut down super fast. But. Ah, the guilt, initial guilt that one must feel in that situation. No, for real. And I think it has, you know, a little bit to do with you being younger. You're maybe more trusting. Also, it was the late 90s. There was not as much awareness or discussion around consent and, yes. you know, be, uh, campus safety even. There's laws passed after this. So uh, that could also have something to do with it. One of the women that Paul Flores had inappropriately tried to kiss, grow up, grab, goes, Oh, I mean, you know, back then it was like, oh, he's kind of annoying. She said now, through the lens I'm looking at it now, it's like, that is unacceptable. Yeah, for sure. But she said at the time you kind of went, oh, we're just, you know, young. He's just messing around. It's just a joke. So if somebody being like, will you kiss me? Will you kiss me? I mean, nowadays you slap him in the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, you'd file a report. Yeah, you should. And maybe, you know, luckily times are changing. Yes. No, I mean, I, Kristen graduated high school in 96. I graduated in 97. So... Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can concur that that is kind of the attitude it was back then. There wasn't the Me Too movement. There wasn't, mm -hmm. I mean, the attitude of it's boys will be boys was mm -hmm. pretty um, abhorrent in a lot of situations of like, this is just how guys kind of act, you know, like you don't want to be that girl that says something, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm a, I'm a guy's girl. One of just those. Just be cool. Yeah. Just, just cool. so it was, it was a different time. And I think, uh, have we, do we still need to make a lot of changes? Of course, but a thousand percent things have changed since when I was in high school and college to what is deemed acceptable and what women would uh, not just brush under the rug and say like, well, whatever, he's weird, but I'll let it go. No, he's weird and we're going to cancel him <laughs> or yeah. we're going to we're, we're gonna report him to police. You know, we're not going to let our friends walk off with him. Yeah, it's just, it's good. It's I think it's, we're making strides in the right direction. Like you said, still room to go, but. Sure, sure, sure. And so Cheryl left and for the longest time, everybody thought, okay, well, Cheryl's the last person that saw him. And then when Chris Lambert was going through the privilege log for all the evidence that was collected by the sheriffs, you know, the their civil suits will go to you'll we'll go through in an, a later episode. But as part of that discovery process, the lawyer said, hey, we want to see all the evidence you have. And the sheriff has to go through and say, this is safe to be given to a lawyer. This is not, you know, we're going to still part of the ongoing investigation or something that you can use in your civil suit. And 
Chris Lambert noticed something that said Australian exchange student, and he said he hadn't read about that anywhere. He hadn't seen that anywhere. So he was able to cross-reference LinkedIn, graduation records, history, find this guy who was, he was an Australian student. He was a little bit older at the time. He now lives in Norway, and he was attending Cal Poly back then. And he told police at the time he was riding his bicycle from the library area through campus, and he saw two people, a male and a female, in a uh, lobby kind of area, a glass lobby area. He said the lights were super bright from the inside. Of course, it's late, you know, 2, 3, 2.33 o'clock in the morning, so it's dark on the outside. So they just see figures kind of wrestling each other in the distance. But he said he was on his bicycle, but he did say, I knew I could see it was a male and a female. And the female was so much taller than the guy, at least over six foot. And the guy was a few inches shorter. And she had her arms above her head like she was pushing him forward, pushing him away, pushing him off of her. And he said he that he could see it was like a clean shaven young guy. He was white, um, you know, a little bit less than six foot. Matches Paul Flores and mm-hmm. Kristen Smart's description. And he told that to police and then, you know, didn't really he was nervous about getting involved because he um, didn't want to he was trying to go back to Australia. So he didn't tell them initially. But once he had gone back to Australia, they got in contact with him. He went down to the station uh, where he lived in Australia and gave a statement. You know, he was fully cooperative, but you can kind of understand at the time if you think I'm going to get wrapped up in this investigation. I'm trying to leave the country. And not for nefarious purposes. He was just done with school and it was time to go. Mm -hmm. So he did cooperate and come forward. And now you say, okay, there was some type of struggle. Mm -hmm. Before they even got up to the room. Yes. And it was maybe not in her dorm. So that's the other question. Or not in his dorm. So it was near, it was like a building that kind of connected dorms. But they were wrestling somewhere. And then somehow we see where she finally ends up. Based If you believe the cadaver dogs. Sinisterhood will be right back. I've been off my shaving game for the winter, but with the warmer weather and summer around the corner, I cannot wait to get back into my regular routine. First shave after letting your hair grow for a while is very satisfying. I uh, shaved right before we came in the studio. It wasn't, I mean, I did it partially. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just partially for you, but also (laughs) because I went for a run and took a shower anyway. But uh, I do love it because when I run, my uh, legs aren't rubbing up against each other. Yes. And my arm, my underarms aren't rubbing up against each other. I need a razor that makes shaving uncomplicated and is gentle on my skin, leaving it moisturized, super smooth, and bump-free. And the Athena Club razor is hands down the best razor I've ever had. Athena Club's razor has thousands of five-star reviews and is designed with built-in skin guards and an innovative handle to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on curves. Plus, the razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, which is a holy grail for skincare. The best part is the razor kit's only $9 and comes with your choice of handle color, an extra blade head, and a magnetic hook for easy shower storage. I'm all about that magnetic hook. (laughs) And I love the color of mine. I got the rose. You got midnight, right? I did. I did. Athena Club has the dreamiest shave foam that's also back in stock. Together, the Athena Club razor and shave foam will leave your skin soft, hydrated, and smooth. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club razor kit. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code SINISTER. That's A-T-H-E-N-A-C-L-U-B dot com with promo code SINISTER for 20% off. Sometimes I don't have the time or energy to cook, especially something healthy. And by sometimes, I mean all the time because <laughs> every day I don't like to cook. Tommy mm-hmm. does all the cooking. And uh, by the time we get around to dinner every night, what do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to eat? It's exhausting. But now we have Daily Harvest, Heather. I love this Daily Harvest because we do the same thing. Paris does the cooking here. And if we're both exhausted, we just end up ordering takeout. And honestly, Mm -hmm. I don't feel great when I end up getting takeout for like every meal. But this all changed once we found Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers delicious food all built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It takes literally minutes to prepare. And I have never have to think twice if the food I'm eating is good for me. Daily Harvest is ready when you are. Everything stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it. So you waste less food, too. No need to overthink any of your meals for the week with Daily Harvest. Smoothies for breakfast, crisp flatbreads for lunch or dinner, and food that's perfect for cooler weather if you're still living in a place where it's a little crisp, like their perfectly roasted harvest bowls and soups. 
Daily Harvest never uses preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything, including their recently launched almond milk, which is made of only almonds and a dash of sea salt. That's it. This is super convenient because I'm always stocked up whenever I need almond milk for my smoothies. Daily Harvest is also committed to minimizing their environmental impact. They're in the process of transitioning to 100% compostable, recyclable, plant-based, and renewable fiber packaging. Get started today. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code creepy to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code creepy for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. Paul Flores had graduated the year before from Arroyo Grande High School, less than 20 miles from where he now went to college. He was a below average student with grades that normally wouldn't see acceptance into Cal Poly. However, the university tended to be more lenient on those from the Central Coast. Unsurprisingly, his grades continued to suffer in college, with several failed classes, earning him a .6 GPA. He passed bowling class, though, I heard. Oh, good for him. Yeah. yeah. .6 is... Wow. Don't they kick you out at some point? I would imagine you would not be asked back to come, yes, for the following uh, semester. Paul's problems seemed to date back as early as middle school. In seventh grade, his family agreed to pay medical bills for a fellow student Paul attacked in a fight at school. The student gave an interview on Your Own Backyard, in which he described a tussle with Paul that turned serious when Paul jumped up off the ground with both feet in the air and landed on the victim's head, causing blindness, amnesia, and months of headaches. Later, in an audio recording of a deposition, when Ruben Flores, Paul's father, was asked about the settlement with the seventh grade victim, Ruben was unable to quickly remember which incident Paul had been involved in, as there appeared to be so many. Yeah, this was also a, uh, to me, an indication of his parents' either willful blindness to everything or his parents are straight up enabling him. Because yeah. they both repeat this fake version of the story where Paul was the victim mm-hmm. and he was attacked and he was defending himself. And the person whose medical bills had to be paid said, oh, no, hell no. I was bullied. I fought back. And Paul flipped shit. He It's like a switch flipped in his head. He got super enraged and stomped a fellow student in the face. He said he had a footmark on his face mm. and... Obviously, if you have to, I mean, it didn't cause permanent blindness and amnesia, but the kid was like confused. He had to be taken to the pediatrician. The pediatrician flipped out and took him to the hospital. So it's like there's more here than just a couple kids got into a fight. Mm -hmm. It was a small tussle that he got, like I said, a flip, a switch flipped in his head and he went ape shit. He raged out. Overboard. Well, we'll see that the... Claiming to be the victim when you are clearly anything but is something that the family um, is pretty good at. They're very good at. And then, and then, like I said, both Ruben and uh, Mama Susan in de- separate depositions, sworn depositions, said, well, poor Paul was attacked. Mm-hmm. It wasn't him. So they're either delusional or flat out just enablers. Yeah. Described by fellow Cal Poly students as annoying. Paul's parents said he also had no friends in high school. High school classmates described him as being a loner who had a severe stutter. There was another classmate also named Paul. The students referred to him as Paul and called Flores Psycho Paul. Another classmate described how Paul would show up to parties uninvited, at times hiding in the bushes and startling students who saw him standing there. The classmate told Chris Lambert, the host of Your Own Backyard, that Paul got kicked out of parties a lot or was asked to leave. She was also not surprised to hear that Paul possibly attacked a girl. Female co-workers throughout the years told Lambert several stories about being made uncomfortable, stalked, groped, or physically attacked by Paul. He had a pattern of yes. behavior. He drove up one-way or dead-end driveways to where girls lived. Even So it's not like, well, I just happened to be passing by your house, followed them home. They would be in other parts of the city out with their friends, and he showed up. And she said, oh, my friend jokingly said I had a stalker. No, she did. It no, wasn't a joke. No, you did have a stalker. Yeah, and then he, it's not he a did joke. the same thing to another girl. He pushed one of the girls that he worked with inside of his house that he or an apartment he shared with his sister and locked the door behind her in the pitch black dark, and she had to... Tell him, I'm going to scream and wake your sister up if you don't let me out of here. So He's he a just, maniac. He's a he total has, maniac. He ran up behind a girl and grabbed her crotch in a parking lot and then, like, laughed about it. And so he's 
He's got a series of very, not only just saying creepy, uncomfortable stuff. They said he would like slide up next to them and be like, the sunset's so beautiful tonight. And they're like, wait, what? But from that, kind of like, that's kind of strange. He's kind of harmless, but just off-putting too. I was unlocking my car after a shift late at night in the parking lot, and he came up and literally grabbed me my vagina. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean- like with most people that are that way, it escalates, which yes. is what, what happened here. Yeah. Weird watching people at high school parties. And she kind of made the comment, well, you know, nobody's really like invited to a high school party, but he definitely wasn't and would still show up, but then wouldn't even fully show up, just kind of show up and stand like on the outskirts. And she said, we realized we were talking about him and then be like, oh shit, he's right over there. Like he's oh. like sneaky, creepy, yeah. leaving flowers and people are like, oh, yeah, we saw him park on your street and walk up to your house and leave those flowers. It's, it's a, a horror movie. It's, I is. mean, this is straight up like a, a thriller movie you'd watch about the stalker, creepy guy in high school. Not only does he have bad social skills and is awkward, that's a ton of people you go to high school with. He crosses the line into extremely problematic illegal yes. assault behavior. Correct. Yeah. It's one of those where it's it's not just, hey, we need to talk to this kid about his, you know, he's got some behavioral problems. It's he's attacking other students mm-hmm. that he needs to be helped in some yes. fashion. He needs to be singled out, assisted help. But again, late 90s, there yeah. wasn't awareness about a ton of stuff going on. It was literally all the people from high school said, he's a creep. He's a weirdo. We called him that weird albino kid because he's real pale and he was... Uh, boys back then would bleach their hair. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, he had bleached hair. And so we called him that weird albino kid from the grocery store. It was kind of the idea of like, oh, he's weird, but we can't, what are we going to do? Tell him to stop coming around? Yes. 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 Tell him to stop coming around. And none of that is good behavior either. No. I mean, you know, I mean, that's not the right way to handle it either. But again, it was the 90s and that's how people did. But his parents knew that he didn't have friends and that this was kind of his reputation. And they even said, he didn't have any friends. We bought a pool table for the house because we thought it might Lore. kids might come out. Yes, basically kids might come over and play and then, you know, he'd have people to talk to, which if it wasn't this person we're talking about is sad. Yes, That's, it, that is a sad thing for for parents to know about and for your to know that your kid has no friends. Yeah. He has no friends because of how he's acting. Yes. But it's up to someone, teacher, parents to step school in counselor. and get and school counselor to get him the help he needs if you see this pattern of behavior that isn't just weird it's straight up violent it's abnormal violent yes. harmful to others yeah there's something he bashed a kid's head in with his feet yeah. and his and grabbed a girl's crotch yeah that crosses huge lines and especially the stalking behavior stuff like that where at some point, you can't just laugh it off anymore. But Mm-mm. again, they didn't know that. You know, if the woman that stalked at his job didn't know that at a previous job he had done that. Or the woman who gets shoved into his apartment didn't know that he grabbed his other co-worker's crotch. So mm-hmm. it's like there wasn't, you know, they not not enough information. Not, not that it could have, you know, but no, there was no reports made. Right. So there was like no trail of it. But they also said, yeah, his parents came to his one of the jobs. I think it was the, the burger flipping job and brought food for everybody and the coworker said it was like they were really excited that he had people around him. And they were like, are you guys having fun? Are you getting along? Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you want us to like be friends with them? Like mm-hmm. they kind of knew he was not uh, that he was uh, the annoying guy that people didn't like. Yeah. Or just not well liked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At Cal Poly, he was infamous for becoming obnoxious when he drank and hitting on other guys, girlfriends, often right in front of them. His creepy behavior towards women had even earned him the nicknames. Chester the Molester and Scary Paul, according to the L.A. Times. Those are not good nicknames. No, he's had three not good nicknames at all. One has Scary, one has Psycho, and one has Molester. The not trifecta. anything I want to be called. Yeah. yeah, the trifecta of bad nicknames. But mm-hmm. and again, it's at least to now somewhat uh, reputational. Like his behavior precedes him, so people are maybe a little bit more aware. That yeah. he's sidling up. Residents of Paul's dorm told investigators he would often spend weekend nights sitting in his room alone, getting drunk, and then roam around the campus looking for parties. Five months before Kristen's disappearance, the LA Times reported the campus police were called to the apartment of a female student after a drunken Paul Flores climbed up to her balcony and refused to leave. When police arrived, 
Paul had left and no arrest was made. There was also another set of girls that were getting a ton of hang-up phone calls, and they traced it back and figured out that it was him. It was the same girls. Yeah. As, as these. They were like, oh, it's probably him since he tried to get into our balcony a few weeks before. <sighs> oh. So his behavior in high school just escalates in college, and, especially yeah. with the added uh, addition of alcohol. Yes, yes, yes. And without the parental oversight, you're yes. going back to a dorm every night. You're not exactly. going back to mom and daddy's house. Yeah. Six weeks after the balcony incident, Flores was pulled over for speeding. When the officer noticed Flores's bloodshot eyes and slurred speech, he issued a breathalyzer test. With a reading of 0.13, Paul failed. This resulted in a DUI and the loss of his license, according to the LA Times. And this will also become a pattern in his life of DUI arrest. Yes. On May 27, 1996, Kristen's dorm neighbor, Jennifer, became concerned that neither she nor anyone else in the dorm had seen Kristen over the past two days. She reported her missing to the campus police, who initially assumed Kristen had gone on an unannounced camping trip for the Memorial Day weekend. They came to this conclusion despite the fact that things someone would take on a trip, like her identification, toiletries, and clothes, all remained in her room. Yeah, the one friend said, well, the roommate said, well, I was gone one night, but I came back and she wasn't there, and I figured out she may be with her parents because she had left a bunch of stuff out on her bed, so she clearly wasn't sleeping here. But by the time Monday rolled around, school was fixing to start back up on Tuesday, and they said, well, you're about to miss school. Why, you know, she should be back by now. Let's call the police. And the police said, "Mm, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Guys, why are you calling? This is going to be the first of a series of egregious blunders by the police. It's a great way to phrase that. Jennifer persisted, but continued to be brushed off by campus police. She called the San Luis Obispo PD, but was redirected back to the campus police. Speaking with the Cal Poly police again, they still wouldn't file a report. Instead, they called the Smarts at their home, asking if Kristen was with them. The Smarts were panicked, but campus police reassured them that their daughter had most likely gone camping. Just brushing it off. Oh, that phone call. That makes my stomach hurt to think about. That is, I mean, yeah. it's the, the trope of it's every parent's worst nightmare to get, a, to get a call like that. And because she called every Sunday and she hadn't called on Sunday, her parents had thought, well, it's the holiday weekend. She'll probably call tomorrow. So they'd been waiting for her to call. And then this is the call they get. Yeah, instead. Wow. Yeah. And look, good on her. And the, the girls are interviewed in your own backyard. And they were like, we were vers- being responsible friends. Yeah. They said we weren't going to let this go. We said, we know this is weird. She would not have left her ID and her money and her toothbrush and her shoes and everything yeah. here. And they just got brushed off of like, you guys are just his- being hysterical. Mm-mm. Good for those girls. Mm-hmm. Knowing their daughter would not take off without telling them. Stan Smart made immediate arrangements to fly out to Cal Poly. He met with the campus police, who, unsurprisingly, weren't very helpful and failed to act appropriately and did not contact local law enforcement agencies in a timely manner, according to the Kristen Smart scholarship site. Years later, in an interview with the L.A. Times, Stan equated the initial treatment of his daughter's disappearance by campus police to that of a lost bicycle. Finally, on May 28, 1996, Cal Poly police filed a missing persons report. Oh, to just, you're beating your head against a wall. Mm-hmm. Somebody take this seriously and help us. That every time we do a case or you read about anything or see it in the news where the police or doctors or people like that are telling the family or the parents, it, it's fine. They probably just went out. They're probably at a boy's house. They'll come back. You know your kid better than anyone, and when some official is trying to gaslight you and mm-hmm. tell you, calm down, they pro- this happens all the time, it may happen all the time, but I know my daughter, and she would not do this, so you need to listen to me. I'm telling you right now, some- I can't imagine the frustration and just pure anger that comes along with that. There has to be because he uh, Stan described her. He, you know, she's the oldest and she's got a little brother and then a little sister after that. Mm-hmm. And they said she was a parent pleaser, that she was a rule follower, leader, parent pleaser and would not go running off mm-hmm. and not tell her parents. 
So, again, like you said, you're being gaslit by the authorities when you say, I will tell you right now, she calls me every Sunday and she didn't call me. I know that means something. Her roommates are, it's not just the parents are being right. frantic. It's the people that literally live with her, mm-hmm. literally are not being listened and to. And all of her, her prescription medication, yes. her ID, her clothes, everything is in her room. Yeah. No, it's it makes no sense. And luckily there's been legislation t- to change this, but at the time it was siloed to campus yeah. PD. Feeling as if they were getting no help from the police, Stan and Denise took matters into their own hands. Stan began questioning students and posting missing person flyers around campus. They hired lawyers and private investigators and reached out to acquaintances in the Napa PD, according to the LA Times. Stan moved to San Luis Obispo to be as close to the investigation as possible and began tirelessly searching for his daughter with the help of her friends and concerned members of the community. Denise stayed at their home in Stockton, just in case Kristen were to call. It just rips the family apart, and also it's all consuming, as it should be. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's understandable, but that's just, it goes to show you that when someone is taken, then the victims extend all the way out to the family members, to everybody. 100%. And so they're, the, now what they're, the, whatever, normal life they had, you're quitting your job, or you're taking a leave of absence from your job, you're becoming obsessed with it. Because there's no other way to be. That's You're the, just sitting by the phone all day. Mm-hmm. You have two other children that you still have to, to parent and look after. With mm-hmm. this, is consuming every waking second. And that LA T- Times article is very informative and very well written. And when they interview Stan, he said he followed up on literally every single lead that would come in. Mm-hmm. That psychics would contact him and say... She's buried on this on a hill at this location, and he would drive in the middle of the night to go just search there. Another um, someone using like uh, uh, those what are they called? Dowering rods? Oh, like a water divination? Yeah, yes, like something like that. Was like she's in Lake Tahoe. He straight up like just got in his car and drove to Lake Tahoe to you know. And every time it would it would be like nope, she's not there. But he, I mean, nothing was something he didn't follow up on. Yeah. He's they they did it. literally you look at these parents and you say and with this outcome, luckily something happened even, you know, 20 years later. But at no point did they drop the ball. The the mm-hmm. number one advocates for their daughter was Stan and Denise. They did not ever stop, no. which is bless them. But also that's that's not fair to them. That's so sad that they had that that had to become their life. But. It's the it's the picture of perfect parents, though, that say, we will literally do anything it takes. Like, I will drive to Lake Tahoe. I don't care. This person yeah. could be crazy, but they could be right. I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah. The journalist who wrote that LA Times article, Lambert, interviews him on Your Own Backyard, and he says, of course, Kristen was the primary victim, but her parents have been victims for this entire time. Mm-hmm. And he said, it's worse than a prison sentence. A prison sentence, you go to prison, you do your time, you get out, but they are just prisoners of their mind. And they have, you know, I mean, even with an arrest and if they find a body that still doesn't bring their daughter back, Mm -mm. does it provide some sense of closure? You would have to ask ask them, but you, that's just something they never, you never get over. Mm -mm. What he said too. Uh, his name is Peter King, and he was a yes, freelance it. true crime journalist. And he, I love how he told Chris Lambert, maybe your podcast will be my legacy. Mm-hmm. And it is. It is. Because Chris said when he started out, there really wasn't anything written about it. But Peter had written this article, and that was the seed to start the next thing, start the next mm-hmm. thing. So it's really, I, I think it's neat to see how things build on each other. And this now the resolution, almost resolution, I think once her body is found and he's Paul and Ruben are both convicted, that'll be the resolution. But he mentioned, Peter King mentioned that for parents, when your kid is missing and there's no body, you have to tell yourself it's 99.999% chance that they are dead, but there's still that 0.0001% chance that they could still be alive and I'm not going to give up. Mm-hmm. And that's so heartbreaking too. Like you said, every time your phone rings, mm-hmm. it's like, this mm-hmm. is it, this is it. But for them, luckily, you know, 2021, something, something happened. Yeah. In the missing persons report filed by campus police, the officer wrote, Smart does not have any close friends at Cal Poly. Smart appeared to be under the influence of alcohol on Friday night. Smart was talking with and socializing with several different males at the party. Smart lives life her own way, not conforming to typical teenage behavior. 
The patrol officer summed up his report by adding, These observations are in no way implying that her behavior caused her disappearance, but they provide a picture of her conduct on the night of her disappearance. Oh, my God. Wow. You typed that. Sir, you typed that. You had a chance to push the backspace. You didn't. You typed it. You hit print. You put it in the file. Maybe you hand wrote it. I don't know how things were in the 90s. They Not only did you write it, you first thought it. You first you thought, thought it. Of, you thought about it, and you thought, how am I going to write this to put in an official report? Yeah, I'm going to, instead of, he's like, it would be, a, it's really short to say she's asking for it. So instead of that, I'm going to mm-hmm. type like four sentences, mm-hmm. and then it'll seem less like I'm saying it. Yeah. But that's literally what you're saying. Oh. <laughs> I don't care if she was blackout drunk or sober as a judge. None of that matters. No. It doesn't matter how much she'd been drinking. It doesn't matter what she was wearing. It doesn't matter how many guys she talked to at this party. None of that has anything to do with the fact that she was most likely raped and murdered. Targeted. Attacked. Yes. Targeted. Attacked. Targeted. Attacked. And God knows what else happened to her. Yeah. That's exactly... Uh, that's the person that that's the person's behavior you should be worrying about. Yes. That person who two other people saw was being a creep with her on her walk back. And then a ton of people at the party saw was being a creep at the party. And then like literally every other person that interacted with him could have told you he was a creep in his everyday life. That's the behavior that you mm-hmm. should worry about and ask about what that had to do with the disappearance. Not she had been drinking that night. Mm-hmm. I watched this YouTube by, Um, a doctor named Dr. Todd Grande who breaks down different true crime cases. And um, he gave the analogy of if you had a car accident and the person that got hit wasn't wearing a seatbelt, they might get a ticket for not wearing a seatbelt, but the person that hit them because they were speeding and ran a red light, isn't not going to get uh, sued or a ticket for doing that. Just because it's like, It's not going to be like, well, you weren't wearing a seatbelt, so we can't press charges against the person that hit you. Or, or, you know, you're kind of asking for it. One doesn't uh, have anything to do with the other. Well, in some states, if it's if your injury is because you didn't wear a seatbelt, then they would say that's contributory negligence. A lot of times states have comparative and they go like you're like one percent responsible for your injuries because you weren't wearing a seatbelt. So they have to pay 99% of the bills, not 100%. There are some states, although it's now a minority, where they would say, well, you're partially responsible because you don't have a seatbelt on, so you're not going to get paid. Super vast minority, though. Very dumb thing to think about as a lawyer, but you have to. But that's you can see how, exactly what you're saying, that's a really stupid rule to have. Mm -hmm. That just because you weren't wearing a seatbelt and maybe that made you a little bit more injured than you would be, that does not... uh, take away the negligence and the liability of the person who is flagrantly, egregiously breaking multiple laws and being super unreasonable in their behavior. So I think you're right that that's, and that tons of states are moving away from that because it is patently unfair. But yeah, to say anybody, well, she had something to do with it. It's like, no, we should all be able to be free and not be attacked. Can we focus on, instead of saying, don't go out to a party and get drunk, could you focus on maybe raising your kids not to attack and murder people at a party? That would be probably a lot more effective and save Let's a lot more lives. Let's also focus on uh, training our campus patrol officers <sighs> to not uh, slut shame yeah. and victim blame. Yeah. Let's maybe work on that too. Yeah. I mean, I think the good thing too now is that a lot of campuses, everything's on film, you know, cameras around and maybe those blue boxes where you can mash the buttons, but. We had those at, yeah. on campus. Yeah. Two days after Kristen was last seen. Flores had been arrested on unrelated charges, an outstanding warrant for a DUI. At the arrest, Flores had a black eye and scratches on his hands and knees. When questioned about them, he told investigators that the injuries were the result of a basketball game. However, when a detective questioned another student who had also played in the game, he said Flores had shown up with the injuries. Paul Flores was now considered a person of interest in the case. Yeah, he's. this is where things start to get... Uh, between him and his dad, they're, they start to try to get their story straight. Mm-hmm. The Cal Poly police still had jurisdiction over the case. Realizing they were in over their heads, they enlisted two veteran investigators from the district attorney's office to help, according to the L.A. Times. Over the course of the following week, the investigators spent hours each day with Flores, asking him questions about the frat party and walking Kristen home. 
The more they questioned Paul, the more inconsistencies cropped up in his story. This is, again, as this starts to unravel, why was he not, why wasn't more done? Why, why did it take 16 days for cadaver dogs to be taken to that dorm room? Why wasn't he charged with something? Why wasn't DNA taken from his room as soon as you know that that girl went missing and that he was the last seen with him? And then he shows up and he has a black eye and scratches. And uh, they deep cleaned his room. Uh, yeah. The university deep cleaned his room. There yeah. is conjecture. Mm -hmm. It is merely conjecture that Cal Poly did not want to have a murderer on their campus. And yes. so maybe there was some foot dragging going on. Yeah, there is, con again, just conjecture, but that they maybe were covering something up. Maybe they didn't know exactly what happened, so they couldn't say they were covering something up. But just on the off chance that something had happened, they had a cleaning crew go in and deep clean and disinfect his room. It's uh, very strange. And especially around that time, they were saying there's no evidence of criminal activity. We don't think she was the victim of a crime. She's just a, a missing adult under unusual circumstances. There's that. So a ton of stuff got missed at the dorm. Mom's house. Dad's house. Car. Oh, they dad's just have car. they have weeks to get rid of stuff. Anything get rid of need, evidence. Anything. You need and to then do. and then. You're not even having to get rid of some of it because a cleaning crew got hired to come in and get a lot, get rid of a lot of it for you. It's very fortunate if you had tried, if you had committed a crime and tried to cover it up. This was very mm -hmm. fortunate for you to have investigators this slow to act. And this, yeah. uh, even when they did act, it was not with a lot of vigor. Mm -hmm. There were multiple inconsistencies. First, there were the varying accounts of the origin of Paul's black eye, initially claiming it was a sports-related injury. When questioned by the DA investigators, Flores admitted that that had been a lie. His story now was that the black eye was actually the result of him hitting his face on his steering wheel while trying to change the car stereo in his truck. Additionally, when first interviewed by police, Paul told them he watched Kristen walk up the pathway to her dorm. Paul's roommate, however, had a different account. Telling investigators, Paul told him, He walked the missing person home and then he came back to his room. Reported by the L.A. Times, the roommate went on to say that when he jokingly asked Paul what he had done with Kristen, Paul replied, <laughs> She's at home with my parents. A comment that later would lead many to wonder if Paul had actually been telling his roommate the truth. Yeah, eerie. Very. Fuck. Again, it sounds like he didn't have a lot of... Uh, awareness social awareness mm -hmm. uh how to how to act with others yeah so you wonder was he joking we all know in my opinion she was buried at the parents house and we'll get into that, that in is, the next in the next episode and that's there is corroborated now, by significant yes, evidence and now there's evidence that even shows that do you think he was j joking or do you think he i mean i don't think he was joking i'm trying to phrase this right do you think he was being honest with the roommate and just like flat out telling him or he was like, I'm going to say this and it really is true, but ha ha ha. There's no way he'd believe me. Kind I think of almost like, um, well, like Walter smug White. about it. And I've been watching Breaking Bad. And oh, he's, good. I'm so glad. So good. He's got that big suitcase of money and his brother-in-law picks it up and he's like, what's in here? A bowling ball? And he's mm -hmm. like, half a million dollars in cash. And exactly. Like, ha, 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 ha. Or on Gross Point Blank when she's like, what have you been doing? He's like, contract killer. I've been yeah, murder yeah. for hire. And it's. People saying many a truth are spoken in jest. And David, it's T-S-E is the last name, the roommate, was out of town that weekend. And so, of course, he's getting questioned. He's like, I don't know. I was out of town. But Paul had said, <laughs> she's home with my parents. I think it was at this point, this is what, June 10th or after, thereafter, he's, gonna, he's thinking, I'm going to get away with it. Although yeah. the investigators in one of the interviews that's been recorded said, this isn't going to go away, Paul. We're never going to quit. We're never going to stop. We're going to pursue you until justice is done. Did they know it would be 20 years? Mm. I don't know. But I think even with that statement and that uh, his dad on his side, I think he thought they're never going to, they don't have a body. They're never, whatever yeah. happened to her body in his mind and in his dad's mind, I believe that you, how, do, how else do you live your life so freely if, unless you believe the cops are never going to find her body. Yeah. Yeah. 
We're going to get into all of that in the next episode. So and, much to uh, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do we think so far? I think, uh, well... Like you said, this the initial investigation was the first in many ball drops that went mm-hmm. on, uh, and not in the good New York, the Times Square kind of way. The drop the ball in that they had tons of opportunities uh, to collect evidence and samples and things from various locations and didn't. So I think uh, that it's it's a, it's a bad job. Is that is that a hot take? <laughs> a, no, I, I think, think that so. uh, I think that. Everyone has come out and said this was this was a bad job. It almost seems like they just kind of looked at it as, well, she was wearing a crop top and she was real drunk at a frat party and flirting with a lot of people. And so, things happen. So, yeah. You know? And then we'll get into possible uh, corruption. Maybe people know people and allegations of that which mm-hmm. may pinpoint it. One of the investigators in the L.A. Times article said, people just see it on TV. So I'm paraphrasing, but it said something like, you know, people see it on TV and they think if something's not solved in 30 minutes that we're doing a bad job as mm-hmm. investigators. Okay, that's not true. Here's the thing. I can look at uh, rational, reasonable choices that you may make as an investigator and why you've done things the way you've done. And when we get to the Parkinson years after 2011, although it's been 10 years, you can see the strides and leaps and bounds of what has what investigators are doing, especially after there's a dedicated cold case investigator. So I'm not saying, wow, everybody that was involved in this were complete fucking idiots, but the people sure at the beginning did, mm-hmm. like they said, they were all in over their head, did not know what they were doing, and then it drug it out, and then it put a ton of burden on the cold case, cold case investigator and the later sheriff who took it super seriously. Later on, they got put a burden got put on them that they luckily shouldered they've come out you know with a good result now but a ton of stuff could have been done up front that and this i don't even think this is like sunday morning or whatever monday morning quarterback armchair quarterback i think if you look at this from a what is a standard of professionalism that should have been done at the time it it ain't this ain't it Mm -mm. this ain't it in my opinion no and would it have saved Kristen's life no she was already correct dead would it have prevented multiple other women from being sexually assaulted over the next 20 years? Yes, yeah. it would have. Yeah. And would, would it, it have gotten a killer off the street? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And saved her parents the yes. heartache, sleepless nights, and uh, what I'm guessing is probably millions of dollars that they've yeah. poured into this over the years, yeah. which, again, that's just being that's the, being the parent that you can, the best parent you can be under the circumstances of we're going to pour everything into it. But had this been uh, concluded in a timely fashion, it would have saved a lot of people, especially the future victims, a lot of heartache. For sure. Well, we will get into all of the uh, evidence. We can yes. call it evidence. Yes. Yes. Lots of lots of damning evidence, in my opinion, that just kind of yeah. uh, nobody okay. seemed to give a shit about. <sighs> In the next episode, as well as... um, Lost some of it. Some lawsuits and stuff. Yeah, yeah, just losing losing evidence and and things like that. If you're... I will put a call to action to our listeners uh, from the lawyer perspective. If you're familiar with this case and there's ever been a legal question you've had about it of why did this happen or why didn't this happen, uh, DM it on Instagram or Facebook message it and I will collect them and maybe we can make sure they get addressed in our next two episodes. Do you want to email it? Would that be easier? You can also they email not, so it. So they don't get lost in the or DMs? They, that's true. Well, I always feel uh, bad because you check the email and I hate well, it. I'm okay. like, I'll just I put them in a everyone, folder for you. 10,000 emails. Please, everybody. But no, I, if you want to, yeah, do that. Sinisterhoodpodcast at gmail.com or you can use the contact us form on sinisterhood.com mm-hmm. and you just put like subject line like Kristen Smart Law Question or something like that. And that way we can make sure that we address if it's mm-hmm. questions about the charges or the bail or any of the civil lawsuits or the evidence uh and how it was used from the criminal and the civil pro- um perspective any of that we're i'm as we build the notes and the outlines we're trying to do that but a lot of times after we cover a case i've noticed people come back with follow-up questions mm. and since this is a three-parter i thought might as well throw it out there that's a great and idea. that way we will make sure uh your questions are addressed yeah so i'll just create a little folder thank you sinisterhood podcast at gmail.com or go to sinisterhood.com and click contact 
We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including our weekly uh, rotation. We have Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice segments, and Judge Christie, where Christie is the judge and her word is the law. <laughs> you also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll be hopping on occasionally, and we're now hosting monthly Q&As with Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. Yes, our monthly Q&A for the month of May on Crowdcast will be May 22nd at 2 p.m. Central, and we will put the link up to sign up on Patreon. And for our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. And if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I am on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Shannon Kramer. Grace Nichols. Janet Ivey. Caitlin Newton. Danny. Laura Lewis. Liz Peterson. Alyssa. Abby Rivera. Rochelle Stevens. Mary Grant. Louise Rogers. Kirsty Fitzsimons. Stephanie Bowder. Jill Barabalt. Emerald Stanley. Dama Fortuna. Gabrielle Super. Jerrica. Taylor. Allie Peregrino. Kayla Smith. Caitlin Doherty. Allie. Amy Nelson. Beth Armstrong. Ellie Graham. Amber McLean. You guys. Dun, it's dun, 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 my dun, future dun, 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 dun. husband, Paris T. Brown, the love of my life. Thank you for finally subscribing. <laughs> Jessica Potter. Sarah Bittlinger. Kate. Allison Saray. Ellie Jeremio. McKenna Kaiser. Maddie Hayes. Samantha Bridge. Betsy W. Betsy Anderson. Ruthie Rodriguez. Suzanne Hall. Mary Hayes. Katrina Knight. Megan Halk, Kim Lanier, Laura Rodriguez, Abby Stewart, Chelsea, Hannah Harvinian, Barbara B, Caitlin Gamble, and Anna, or Anna, however you say your name, it's beautiful. And now I hope we said everybody else's names beautiful as well and correct. We sincerely appreciate you guys. We couldn't do this without you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Sinister. <laughs>